sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to say, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing. Just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that He is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how trust him more. I'm going to ask if you will this morning turn with me to the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk known as one of the minor prophets, uh, known as a minor prophet not because his uh, proclamations are any less important than prophets say is Isaiah and Jeremiah, who are known as major prophets, but just the very fact that uh, his letter, his book is uh, shorter than some of the others. So that is how they are divided in our Bibles between major and minor prophets. The major prophets have longer, such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, and the minor prophets are individuals such as Habakkuk and Amos, and those that, uh, whose writings are a little bit smaller, a little bit shorter, but have great content, have great importance to us. And again, we're turning to chapter 3, and we're going to begin today in verse 16. Martin Luther uh, loved to talk about uh, what he called divinity and pronouns. Because he wanted to emphasize just how important a relationship to Jesus Christ was. And uh, what he meant by divinity and pronouns, he says uh, there's a big difference when you read in the scriptures or you talk about the Lord is a shepherd. Or you talk about the Lord is the shepherd. He says those are very different from what David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. The first two really kind of deal with facts. And there are a lot of people out there that uh, would proclaim the fact that, well, the Lord is a shepherd in a sense. Or the Lord may be the shepherd. But what Luther wanted people to understand is there's this big difference between fact and a personal relationship with the shepherd. And that's why David, as he looked at his relationship, could say, the Lord is my shepherd. And that's what Luther, Martin Luther, wanted people to know. He wanted people to understand that very, very important fact. 
It's a fact that we need to come to grips with. We need to come to terms with. That personal relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, even in the midst of the difficult times that we have in our life. And what I want to talk about this morning is specifically a faith, but a special kind of faith. It is what I call a yet faith. And it's a type of faith that even though certain things may be going on around us, yet we can trust in our God. Yet we can depend upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, no matter what the circumstances might be. And so go to Habakkuk chapter 3, and beginning in verse 16, Habakkuk is proclaiming to the people that certain things in the land are not right. They're not living in a way that God desires for them to live. And as such, there are circumstances in their lives that uh, are affecting them. They're affecting them physically, they're affecting them emotionally, they're affecting them spiritually. And yet, they can still have faith in God. So go to verse 16, and uh, at the very end of uh, his proclamations, he says, I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Things were not going well for God's people. And you can see uh, the, the physical effect it was having upon them. And as you look at the, that first part of that verse, you can look at that and say to yourself, I feel like that sometimes and some of the things I'm going through. Well, let's continue on. Verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor food, fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Again, not the type of situation you want to find yourself in. And then verse 18, yet... That yet faith is introduced to us. Regardless of all that, all the bad that is going on, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Isn't that wonderful? That regardless of what is going on in Habakkuk's life and the lives of all God's people, they can turn to God and they can praise Him and they can rejoice Him. Now I know one of the last things that many of us feel when we're going through difficult times is to come and to worship God or to praise God. We're more focused upon ourselves in the struggles that we're facing. But what I want to talk about this morning is how we can get to that point of having this yet faith. That if I'm feeling down and circumstances are, are causing turmoil in my life, yet I can still praise God. I can still glorify His name. I still know, yet I still know God is here with me and He hasn't forsaken me at all. So let's talk about that and, and kind of go verse by verse in what Habakkuk had to share with the people in his day. And the first thing I want us to realize is that the yet faith comes from a place of brokenness. The yet faith comes from a place of brokenness. Now, that's exactly where most of us don't want to be. We don't want to be in a place of brokenness. We don't want to find ourselves in our lives where things are just falling apart or perhaps we feel like the weight of the world is upon our shoulders. It is that place that we would be, rather be anywhere else than stuck there. And so many times it feels like uh, it is problem compiled with com problem after problem after problem. And yet, Habakkuk says, and yet, I believe that many of God's people that we find in the scriptures will say, I can still praise God. I can still lift him up and glorify his name. Look again at verse 16 
where Habakkuk says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Hard times, difficult times, times of struggle, times of turmoil, times of trial that enter into our lives. And yet, God's still there. God will not desert us. And we can turn to Him. Uh, I was talking to Debbie and I uh, had Clay over this past week, and, and one of the things we talked about was back in, in 9-11. And, and many people can remember that time and, and where they were on that particular event. And, and as we talked about it, uh, we reminisced, and Debbie and I thought about the fact that, uh, you know, as that day unfolded, we really didn't know what was going to happen next. And it was, it was truly a very frightening time for this nation. Wondering when and if the next attack would come. And who it would be directed towards. Because we had saw in the morning hours that uh, there was a great plan that was unfolding. And we had absolutely no idea whether it was over or whether it would continue through that day or the days to come. And most of our attention was uh, focused upon what used to be the World Trade Center. And most of us sat in horror as we watched on television, not only as the fire burned, but in time as one tower collapsed and then the other tower collapsed. And then there was this period of months as we watched as they went in not just months, but years, went in and cleaned up that area. A terrible time. Two days after 9-11 on September 13th, a man by the name of Frank Seleccia was helping with the crews going in, not only looking perhaps for survivors, but to go about the task of evaluating and to begin some of the cleanup work. And as he was in there, he went to an area, and as he was serving the area, a Catholic priest by the name of Father Brian Jordan came to where he was standing, and he said, Look, Father Brian. And Father Brian, he, he looked to uh, where Frank was pointing, and he, he really didn't see what he was supposed to be seeing. And, and he asked Frank, well, what is it I'm looking for? And, and Frank said, you just keep looking, you'll see it. And as he, he stood in there, and, and he said it was almost the way that the, the whole area had collapsed in, it was almost like a, this rough cathedral. And as he looked out, he saw it. He saw the cross standing there vertically. And, and it was a cross there and it, there was this sheet of metal on, on one beam of the cross that, that looked almost like it was draped with a cloth. And as they stood marveling at this, other of the workers came in and they too saw the iron cross settled in this cathedral if you will. Well, after a while, uh, others coming in looking at it and work began again. Frank came up, to, uh, come up to Father Brian and he said, Father, I'm afraid they're going to come in and they're just going to scrap that thing like they do all the rest of the metal. Father Brian said, they're not scrapping that. And so he went about the task of gathering a group of volunteers, of getting permission to go in and to lift that cross out. And they took that cross and they, they lifted it out and they placed it upon a concrete pedestal. And Father Brian began to hold services at that cross because he looked around him and he saw all these individuals that were coming in to help, how exhausted they were, and what a toll that this task was taking upon them. The fact of so many people losing their lives in the midst of this. 
And everyone who had a part was affected by it. And so he began to hold services at that cross. The first time he held a service, 25 people showed up. Next time he had a service, 50 people showed up. Then 200 people. And then 300 people. And they continued to hold the service and they continued to pray for the first responders and others. Those families who had lost loved ones in this great tragedy. They prayed for them. And they came to God. And, and Father Brian said it was a miraculous thing. It wasn't just Christians that came to that cross. But it was wide spectrum. There were, there were Jewish people that came there. And he said he remembered one Jewish rabbi came to him after he had held a service at the cross. And he says, I'm so glad that this cross is here. It means so much. Muslims gathered at that cross. Buddhists gathered at that cross. As he would stand and he would proclaim the love of God, he remembered back that after this had first happened, that so many people came up to him and asked him the question, why did God do this? And he would have to share with them, it was not God who did this, but men who were living under their own free will that took so many lives. And now he had an answer to place before them as they would hold these service, that God had not forgotten them, that God had not forsaken them, that God was right there in their midst, even in the midst of this great and terrible tragedy. Now, of course, after time, the people would step in and say, well, you can't have that cross there. You'll offend somebody. And so the cross was moved from place to place. And then finally, uh, the day came when they were preparing the uh, World Trade Center Museum. And it was proclaimed that cross needs to be there. It played such an important part for people who were struggling during this time. And many stepped forward and said, no, you cannot have the cross in that museum. Even went to court. Well, the cross is in the museum. The Iron Cross. It was such an inspiration to so many people on that day and the days to follow. And yet, even in the midst of brokenness, God is there. God is not forsaking you as you look at your own life. And something is broken in your life. Something may be broken in your family. Something may be broken in your marriage. Something may be broken financially. Something may be broken emotionally in you. Something is broken spiritually. And you need direction. You need guidance. And you don't know where to turn. Turn to God. Turn to Jesus Christ. Because even in the midst of brokenness, and yet, He's there. He has not left you. The thing is that there are many times that brokenness needs to enter in before we recognize the fact that He's in control. And it's only in the time of brokenness that true yet faith is going to be evident. That when you face those trials and troubles and tribulations that you can still say to God, I love you. Thank you. And Lord, regardless of what is going on in my life, I praise you for what you're going to do in my life. So, and yet, faith comes out of broken times and brokenness. And yet, faith comes from, I love this one, comes from sucking honey out of a rock. Yet, faith comes from sucking honey out of a rock. 
Go again to Habakkuk 3, verse 17 and 18. He describes the, the dire situation that the nation finds itself in. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, and the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Agriculturally, in regards to all the livestock, there was nothing productive there. It was a time, it would appear, of famine, a time of uncertainty, a time when you could say the land was broken. And they wondered, what are we going to do? And I'm sure the question arose as the question arises in our own lives, where is God in a time like this? And yet, he says in verse 18, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. You know, my livelihood is at stake here. And yet I'm still going to praise God regardless of what is happening. Now, where do I get that? Uh, that and yet faith comes from sucking honey out of a rock. Well, it's not in this verse. You have to go to another verse. And it's found in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32 in verse 13. And it says, He made me ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock, and oil out of the flinty rock. Made him to suck honey out of the rock, and oil out of the flinty rock. What in the world is he talking about? What type of imagery? And I know it brings a certain image to mind. But what exactly is he, he trying to hammer home here? What he wants us to understand of what a truly remarkable God we serve. A God that can lift us up to the highest places, even in the most desperate times of life. It is a God who brings blessings in specific places that the world intends for cursing. Where God can bring blessing, where Satan and the world wants us to be downtrodden, wants us to feel like we are cursed by God rather than being blessed by God. In other words, the last thing you expect to get out of a rock is honey. And so many times in people's lives, the last thing you expect to get out of life when you're facing those difficulties is blessing. That's the furthest thing from your mind. And yet, what the writer of Deuteronomy here is telling us is that's exactly what can happen. That's exactly how God works. That God can give to you honey out of a rock. He can give you blessings out of a difficult time. Prime example of this is Joseph. Most of us know the, the story of Joseph. His father gives to him, his, Joseph out of all his brothers, blessed by his father, father gives him the coat of many colors. And he's got this wonderful coat that dad has given him and he is treated to the ire and the displeasure of the rest of the family. So the last person they want to see is Joseph. And Joseph comes to them and they take him, they throw him into the well, the Bible tells us, into the cistern and uh, trying to decide what to do. Some of the family want to kill him. But Joseph is spared by one brother. And so here comes these travelers, these, uh, these merchants heading down to Egypt. And so they take Joseph and they sell him into slavery to these merchants. And Joseph, he goes down to Egypt and he faces all sorts of trials. For a while, many times it looks like blessings, but then it just re leads right into trial. He, he goes to work into a, a very high official's household as one of the head servants, but then ends up in jail. 
In jail, he's looked upon favorably by the person who is running the jail, but in time, he's forgotten. And so there's this roller coaster ride in Joseph's lives, these ups and downs, these rocks that he's constantly beating his head against. And though because he is able to interpret dreams, he is brought to Pharaoh through a series of circumstances and he interprets some of Pharaoh's dreams. And Pharaoh elevates him to a very high position. And so now here is Joseph. He's over the whole land. There is a famine that has come about, but because of Joseph's interpretation of the dreams, he's been able to deliver the land of Egypt. And so now he's in this high position, he's hooked highly upon, but because there is this famine, not only in, in Egypt, but in Joseph's homeland up in Canaan, here comes Joseph's brothers trying to get food, grain. Joseph recognizes them, they don't recognize Joseph. And through, a, again, a series of events, they come to know their brother and they're fearful of what he's going to do to them. Now, again, Joseph has faced all these difficult times, all these rocks. But Joseph says something very important as he is confronting his brothers who are fearful of what he's going to do. And in Genesis 50, verse 20, Joseph says to them, As for you, you meant evil against me. You are a rock. You are a big rock in my life. And through some of the things that you did, I, I faced some of the, the greatest terrible circumstances of life because of you. You meant evil against me. But God, he said, meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. In other words, Joseph says, here I was presented with this rock, but God brought honey out of it. And many times in your life, there's going to be evil. You're going to come up against a rock. Things are going to happen. Things are going to be said. And the last thing that you expect out of that rock is blessing. But if you have a and yet faith, it's exactly what you're going to get. Joseph met with great trials, and yet God never deserted him. And yet God was always there for him. God spoke to him and, and told him, be of courage. Be strong. And eventually Joseph's time came that he saw the blessings of God. If you will have that type of faith, faith that says, and yet, when you're up against that rock, when you're beating your head against it, you can tell yourself, God has not deserted me. He has not left me. God is still here. And therefore, I'm going to continue to praise Him. And that's why Habakkuk could say that though the fig trees are not producing, the vines nothing, the olive has failed, there's no food in the fields, the flock, the fold, they've been cut off, and yet I'm still going to rejoice in God, still going to rejoice in the Lord. Focused upon Him, not upon the circumstances, not upon what you're suffering with. That, that's generally where our focus is. It's always upon self. But if you will just focus upon God and know that He's at work, know that He's doing something, even sometimes behind the scenes, where it's not visible to you right off, but in time, you will know He is God. He is God. And yet, faith, I will still rejoice. I will still praise Him regardless. 
One last thing we can learn from Habakkuk in this, and yet faith, and that is, and yet comes from a personal communion with God. A personal communion with God. Oh yes, there'll, there'll be brokenness. There'll be those hard stones that you are beating your head against. But you will never really understand this type of faith and yet faith until you are really communing with God. Walking with Him step by step all the way. Remember in the New Testament, after Jesus was crucified, He was buried, He rose again. He began to appear to the disciples. And there were two of His followers, they were on their way back home, going back to Emmaus. We're not privy of the fact that uh, He had risen, just, just heard some rumors. And they're on their way back home and, and Jesus, the risen Lord, He comes alongside them and they begin to talk with one another. And Jesus starts to share with them fact after fact from the Scriptures about what was exactly supposed to take place with the Messiah. And all this time that they're walking, they, they don't recognize who He is. Until they get to their house and they sit down for a meal and they invite Jesus in to sit with them. And as they do, Jesus breaks the bread and their eyes are open and they recognize Him. And He vanishes from their sight. There is a difference from the time they were on the road to the time they were sitting at the table. The time they were on the road, they had a lot of head knowledge about Jesus and about what He was supposed to come to do and about what everyone had said He had done and what they had seen. Had a lot of these things under their belt. But it wasn't until they got to the house and Jesus sat with them and Jesus was communing with them, breaking bread with them, a very intimate time with them, that their eyes are open to the fact it's the Lord. It's Him. It is when they commune that their eyes are open wide. It's the type of relationship you need with Him. Not just a, a relationship where you, you know what the Bible says about Jesus. You know what others have said and, and what they have said He has done for their lives. It's that type of relationship I talked about at the very beginning that Martin Luther talked about. That there is a difference between saying that Jesus is a Lord and that Jesus is my Lord. It is that personal relationship, that person him, that can bring us to that point, that will bring you to that point, that you can have an and yet type of faith. Because if you don't have that communion, guess what? You're going to face brokenness. You're going to be hitting your head against that stone. And the last thing you're going to be able to do is to praise God and rejoice. But if you are communing with Him, if you know Him as your Savior, not just know about Him, but He is your Lord. You can face that brokenness. You can face that rock. And you can still praise and rejoice. There's a lady who had left home one afternoon and she went out to do some shopping. And when she came back, she discovered she had forgotten her key to get into the house. So she wondered, what am I going to do? How am I going to get in? And so she went to some of her neighbors that were also renting rooms near her and she began to ask them for their keys. She, she was just hopeful that maybe one of their keys would open her door. And she walked up to the door and she tried to stick the key in, but none of the other keys would even go into the keyhole. 
There was no way she was going to get in without her key. And so she was sitting outside her door and, and, and a friend of hers walked up and asked what was wrong and she explained the situation to them. And they said, well, have you tried the doorknob? Well, I tried all, all the neighbor's keys. None of them would even go in the key. But did you try the doorknob to see if it was unlocked? She said, no, but I will. And she walked up and turned the knob and the door swung open. She had the ability to access the inside of her house that whole time, thinking it was locked to her, that she had no hope of getting in. But all that time, she could have walked in any time. The door is unlocked for you today. You might be facing those hard times, brokenness, those rocks, stones in your life. You may be living your life wondering where the blessings of life are. And God is saying to you this morning, they're yours if you want them. The door is unlocked. All you have to do is step through. How do you do that? You just surrender yourself to Him. As easy as opening the door and walking in. Bible says that God offers to each and every one of us this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life. And all we have to do is accept it. What's easier than that? You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to purchase it. You don't have to be born into it. You just have to accept the gift. God says, here it is. Give your life to my son. The Bible tells us all we have to do is come to Him and confess the sinfulness of our life to Him. Just lay it before Him. Ask His forgiveness. And He says He will. And from that point on, just to live for Him. Now I know, I can guarantee you, things are not going to be perfect. Things will continue to be difficult at times. There will still be times of brokenness. There will still be those rocks that you're going to be beating your head against. Still going to be those circumstances. Still going to be those times that you fall and fail even though you want to follow Him and trust in Him. But you see, nobody's perfect. Not even the Christian. But we can have and yet faith that regardless of what is happening, guess what? I can still rejoice. I can still praise Him because He has not left me. He has not deserted me. He is there for me. And He's there for you. I want us to bow our heads in prayer.